We live? You ready? Good evening. I'd like to call to order the Bloom Carroll Board of Education Planning Session. Can I get a roll call, please? Mr. Abbott? Present. Mr. Bratton? Mr. Jimmy Johnson? Present. Mr. Rod Johnson? Present. Mrs. Sherman? Present. Pledge of allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item D, consider approval of agenda. Yep. Yeah, no, no changes. I'll make a motion. So, go ahead. Second. Motion is made by Joe Abbott, second by Jimmy Johnson. Mr. Abbott? Yes. Mr. Jimmy Johnson? Yes. Mr. Rod Johnson? Yes. Mrs. Sherman? Yes. E, planning session. All right, we'll uh, kind of take over from here on, on some of these topics. Obviously, you know, we, we talked at our organizational meeting and we felt like having planning sessions in the fall when school gets started and settled is important and then again in the spring as we look at making final decisions about some expenditures and, and services and uh, other purchases uh, that, that we have to make and um, I really wanted to start off and kind of just as we look at 2023-24 um, and we look at the next school year and the next few school years some of the things that are really um, items that we, we need to identify or items that we the, the board needs to be aware of and provide some feedback on uh, Travis and I can certainly do that as well but um, the first one that I really want to make sure as we go into next school year what, what the board is aware of in terms of um, teaching teaching and learning uh, there, there are some things coming out in, in your uh, packet on page seven and eight on your packet um, as you know Jody Raniger our curriculum director presents to the board uh, every year and we kind of go through our uh, curriculum review cycle and you can see on page uh, seven in your packet, page seven and eight, that uh, we have a six-year curriculum cycle. And for 2022-23, uh, what we're doing, what we're doing this year, obviously, is looking at our English language arts in grades K to five, our curriculum resources that our teachers and students and parents have access to, and also social studies curriculum materials for grades K through 12. So that process, again, on page eight in your packet. Um, really involves, you know, um, forming a review committee. Uh, Jody goes out, we look at the data from the previous years, you know, trends over a three, four year period to see how we're doing. Um, our, our results have been very good, um, but, you know, we're always looking for ways to improve. We're trying to identify gaps in our instruction if they exist and, and really take a look at that data. And then we're gonna explore you know, curriculum options from many different vendors. And um, we always wanna make sure that that curriculum is aligned to the Ohio learning standards. And um, you know, those learning standards are not only uh, available to the public on the Ohio Department of Education website, but also on our own school website under our academics tab. We're, we're providing curriculum maps and pacing charts so parents can see what we're teaching, what concepts we're teaching, uh, what the learning targets are for our students. But a, um, different vendors will come in and present to the teachers at, in different grade levels, you know, the K to five teachers for English language arts and then social studies in K to 12. We break up our language arts purchase because it's one of probably, Travis, probably our most expensive <coughs> purchase. Sorry, second behind that. Yeah, so we, we break that up over two years. Next year we'll be looking at, uh, during 23, 24, we'll be reviewing language arts in grades six through 12. But just kind of wanted to let you know that, you know, that six year cycle, we're on to the K-5 and we're on for language arts and we're on to social studies <coughs> in K-12. to um, We'll get to pilot and sample uh, different uh, resources from, and, and again, we're, they're screened to make sure they're appropriate before we, you know, sample those. Uh, but we consider, you know, different vendor resources and uh, consider adoption. Uh, the committee, you know, has teachers, parents, administrators on it. Uh, Jody puts that together. And then we select a new curriculum, we present it to the board, and uh, those purchases are eventually, you know, questioned or approved by the Board of Education. So that's, you know, in terms of teaching and learning, that's one of the big items, uh, you know, that we're working on this year for adoption for next year. The other item I wanted to remind you about, um, on, in, in your uh, packet on page uh, nine, is the list of approved uh, assessments for a universal tier one dyslexia screener 
As you might recall, we've talked about this quite a bit, House Bill 436 and 583. Uh, 583 delayed the implementation or the screener that has to be conducted. Um, it was supposed to be done this year. They backed it up a year. Uh, all K-3 to students will be screened for dyslexia, and then students in grades 4 to 6, uh, per a teacher recommendation or parent uh, concern, obviously would be screened too. So we've got some professional development requirements, and we are currently implementing a um, we're providing professional development with a program called LETTERS. It stands for the Language Essentials uh, for Teachers of Reading and Spelling. It is an ODE approved professional development for our teachers. Our teachers have to receive 18 hours of PD. Um, LETTERS really teaches the skills needed to master the fundamentals of reading instruction like phonological awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, uh, comprehension, writing, and language. And so our teachers are, are in that process this school year and uh, early in August next year, right before school starts to complete the 18 hours. We are providing training to all K-3 to teachers and some intervention specialists. The law requires it for grades K-1, to K, uh, kindergarten and first grade teachers this year. Uh, the following year in 23-24, uh, we will also be providing the dyslexia training to our intervention specialists in grades four through 12. So, um, you know, what, what does that mean? Why am I bringing this up? Well, one, you're going to hear parents, you know, talk about it next year, staff members talk about it, um, and we needed to provide that training this year. But we also, um, we also have to pick a screener, and there's only four that were approved currently by the Ohio Department of Education. However, we expect a new list to come out sometime this winter or early spring, and that means we're gonna to have to purchase one. Currently, we do not have one of these dyslexia screeners. And it, honestly, with some of the initial pricing, it's a tens of thousands of dollars purchase. We're looking at a program um, called MAP. We already have MAP. MAP stands for Measurement of Academic Progress. And we give assessments um, beginning, middle, and end of the year in reading and math to see if students are growing, if they're on track or off track. and. Um, MAP Reading Fluency is another component, another program that is a, an approved, we believe it will be on the approved list, and it already correlates to some of the data that we have. Um, we're looking right now, I think a few months ago, in a $50,000 ballpark uh, for grades K to, K to 3. So these are mandates that they're not funded, but we have to make purchases on. So we got some big curriculum purchases coming up. So how does that work? The, the MAP, we go to MAP. How long is that? Is it good for five years? Uh, that, that's a good question. I, I don't. I think there's initial upfront purchase, and then there's a licensing fee every year with most of our curriculum, our online curriculums, and, and uh, this is one that would be done computer based. And um, yeah, you do typically have a annual license fee on top of that, so it, it will be an additional expense. Uh, we'll always review programs that maybe we aren't utilizing very well, or they're not providing. Uh, a benefit like we expected and always make adjustments where we can but just know standard Travis I think always budget you know puts in the budget a big curriculum purchase on that six-year cycle but maybe one that maybe caught us off guard over the last year and a half is the dyslexia screener so uh, the teachers have to get trained every year or is it just once every year train? no it, it's it's initial and the new teachers coming in as well uh, Will just, they get a certification for that? Yeah, so it's so a great question. The uh, legislation that was passed requires districts to have key team members that have an actual certification. The, the letters training is not a certification program, but we have to have key team members on a multidisciplinary team that reviews the data that it has a certification for dyslexia. So we already started this year. Uh, we have uh, teachers in, a teacher in K-2, to 3-5. to five. We already have one in grades 6 through 8 that we'll be getting uh, Wilson certified with the Wilson reading system. And um, they're currently starting that process now. So we will have those certifications met as well. So Great. Okay. That's all I really have on teaching and learning. I just kind of wanted to make sure that you guys were aware of um, some of the big issues. Okay. Um, the next one is enrollment in um, section two. Section two, we kind of wanted to look at uh, a couple things. Uh, enrollment drives everything. It drives our funding. It drives our needs, uh, staffing, buses, um, 
you know, different support staff, certified staff. So, you know, up on page uh, 10 in your packet, we're currently at 2231. Um, you know, it's starting to fluctuate back and forth. We had a couple withdrawals today, but we've had some enrollments as well. Um, the 2,231 students represent the number of students that are sitting in seats in Bloom Carroll classrooms. Uh, of course, we have more that we're servicing that go off-site, whether it's career centers or alternative placements. Um, you know, there's probably another, maybe another 150 to 200 students um, that are not sitting in Bloom Carroll seats, that are at the career center. Uh, there's about 90 at the career center, and then we have some other you know, students in county consortium classrooms. But what I wanted to let you know right now, uh, we have a total net increase of 43 students at this time. Our class sizes look pretty good in grades K to two in third grade. Um, fourth grade is good because we added that eighth section. We have 188 students. And then I start to get really nervous um, about fifth, sixth, and seventh grade. Yeah. And especially going into next year, um, I've, asked the I've asked the building administration and counselor to look at schedules and try to minimize uh, the number of uh, students in, in each section and the number of teachers that we might need. And that is, that's a tough thing to, to have to do. Um, we're, we're probably, I'll get to it here in a second, but we're, um, we're going to obviously have to address grades uh, 6, 7, and 8 in our middle school next year. Uh, before I get ahead of myself, um, I wanted to look at page, page um, 12 in your packet. You can see the uh, projected enrollment from Cooperative Strategies. Our uh, projected enrollment this year was about 2,245. I do believe we're going to be back up there in a short time period because of some of the subdivisions that are finishing homes right now. Um, you know, we're currently under that, but I would, I would expect by February, I bet we're more than right at 2245. Um, and study, the study, what's yeah, that? The right on horse, the numbers that oh. are right on. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you look so at their more. projections, 161, 166, 179, um, they're, they're pretty close. Now that's easy to do it, you know, a year or two out, but, um, but we're just going to have to constantly monitor this every year. But if, but if their kindergarten projections are correct, if you just look at their kindergarten projections, yeah. that at least gives us some time as those classes push through right. where maybe we're not gaining, you know, as much as we think we will. But, as you know, if those kindergarten numbers really do come to fruition. Yeah. And then they go to, you know, they're always going to add some from kindergarten to first to second. But mm -hmm. that at least gives us a little bit of time there. I think when you look back at page 10 and you look at our current enrollment, like I feel great about 160, but right. you know next school year that's going to be 167, then we're going to be at 175, then we're going to be at, you know, 185, and then we're up to the 190s, and, and that's what's happening if you look at grades, you know, 8, 9, and 10, you start to get some big numbers. So uh, the one thing that I, I like if the projections, the recommended projections hold up, is that if you look uh, down at the table at the bottom of page 12, you know, you look at the K-2 population, and it goes from, you know, recommended uh, about 506 up to 515 in 2031-32. And then you look at grades 3 to 5, well, th that number of students can still fit in our elementary school. Right. You know, so that's a good thing. Uh, 661, it, it gets starts to get pretty crowded, but they get that there's 661 for grades 6, 7, and 8. Uh, that can fit in the middle school. Uh, the problem is grades 9 through 12, 795 cannot fit in the high school, which goes back to some of our facility decisions about trying to maybe free up the modular space and move the district office. So, right. you know, th it would be great if the recommended projections hold up and we, we only see an increase of uh, about 378 students over the next 10 years. That's what was projected. What's the occupancy here at the middle school? It was... 660. Uh, what was it? 660. Yeah. So it's, you know, we... With only three grade levels, I mean, it's... Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, we, we should be right at it, you know. But, again, these don't... Well, even with those modulars, the high school's not going to hold 795. Yeah, it, be it'll be... Uh, yeah. We're at about six. We're at about 625, uh, I think, right now, something like that. And if you put five more classrooms from the modulars in place, you can get another 100, 125 in there, and you're... You're close. You're, it's going to be real tight. You know. The high school could never move over to the school building at that point. Was, no. that the, was it that the plan to make this the high school? Or well, that involves another bond issue because right. we'll have to add on um, 
some, some more classrooms. I think when we get to the, to the next phase of a facility plan, um, you're gonna be looking at, the plan was quite a few additions to this building, maybe out towards that primary school there, and then wrap it around a new six, seven, and eight building or a new seven and eight building at that time. Um, yeah, I'll get into the CFAP, I'll get into the OFCC uh, stuff here in, in just a little bit. Um, so the impact of subdivisions right now, one thing I want to point out on page 13, the Wagnalls Run subdivision, um, that is different than the summit at Wagnalls Run. The summit at Wagnalls Run is the newest phase. Um, that was approved many, many years ago, but they just built it out in phase over really the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, but Wagnalls Run has a student yield of 0.81 students per house as of February of 2022. That is one of our highest student yields per home in the school district. So if that holds true um, with the number of homes that are being built in Wagnalls Run, um, it's, it's gonna be a substantial number of students. Um, the subdivisions, if you look at page 14, this has kind of been updated. Um, page 14 in your packet. I just wanted to go over some of those. Again, the summit of Wagnalls Run there's uh, 196 existing units. There's 263 additional units uh, as part of their plan. Um, if you look at uh, other subdivisions that are happening, you got the Stonehill Estates on Brant Road, and that they haven't been moving any dirt yet. Um, that was you know through the regional planning process. Um, I'm not sure why that's being delayed right now or what you know what the developer is doing, but there are 66 home lots that have been approved there. We'll just have to see if they wait to develop that uh, when the economy is maybe doing a little bit better and rates are lower. Uh, another one is the reserves at uh, the reserves at Farm Creek, um, which is the uh, Rock Mill. It's down. On, or I'm sorry. It's down on. Uh, Carroll Southern, Southern Road, yeah, yeah, Carroll Southern, and there's 27 lots there. Again, they're not breaking ground, so I don't think it'll be anytime soon uh, that we feel the impact from that. Um, and then the Meadows, which is on Lithopolis Winchester Road, that is in the uh, village of Lithopolis. Those are actually larger lots. Uh, most of those, there are 27 lots there uh, as well. And then just so you are aware. There's potential, uh, a developer has reached out to me with a local property owner, um, and I met with the developer. Um, they're, they're just kind of making the school district aware. Um, you know, they're looking at a property behind Meyer on, uh, in Lancaster, which is Bloom Carroll School District. It's about 20 to 21 acres. Uh, they would have to rezone that property from industrial to a, they're trying to do a planned unit district or a PUD development. And that has to go through the Greenfield Township Zoning Appeal Boards and Regional Planning, and then the trustees would ultimately make the final decision, the Greenfield Township trustees. But there's a 250-unit apartment complex uh, that, will, that, that is in discussions and will probably be proposed this winter. Uh, I was told that 45% of the units will be one bedroom, 45% will be two bedrooms, and then 10% would be suites. And um, it's obviously, if 250 units go in, um, you know, they have data, the developer has data, they try to tell you that only two to 3% bring students. Um, you know, apartments in the Bloom Carroll School District uh, will be highly sought after, and uh, I think there would be several students that, that would come in from a development like that. So you may hear something about that this winter that could dramatically impact our enrollment one way or the other. Um, you know, if you look at all the additional units that are on the table right now, not counting just normal lot development along county roads and township roads, just the subdivisions and apartments, you're looking at maybe 633 additional units right now. So just wanted to make you aware of that. Um, back to the one that is definitely, you know, definitely basements are, are dug and uh, People are moving in. We're, we're getting new students right now from this subdivision, but the summit of Wagnalls Run. On, on page four, uh, 15, you can see the number, you can see a uh, housing plan uh, by, it was Westport Homes, I think it's now called DR Horton, is the company that's, for, that's continuing to develop the uh, second phase of this or the last phase of this. And the yellow homes are basically all already in here. 
and then you have this green section, which are the new ones, and this represents another 263 homes right here. Uh, these, let me flip this for you, rotate the screen, but this is uh, Lithopolis Road out here. Um, this is the entrance off of Lithopolis Road, but there are, if you look at these lots from the auditor's website, these are the uh, streets that are currently in, and these are the lots that have been <coughs> developed and basements are being dug or houses are being finished. There's about 90 right now, so 90 of the 263 are kind of currently in the process. And, um, you know, if you, if, if you think about that, at 0.81, uh, maybe you're talking another 70 to 75 students if I did the quick math right, you know, of potential new students this year, if those yield numbers hold true. So that's, you know, again, I don't know if there's much to really say, but I just wanted to make you aware of some of the things we're gonna have to try to manage, okay? Um, what else? Any, Travis or anybody? Just, you know? I assume you guys, a lot of you, you know, stay well aware of this. And uh, I did take a ride back there, and that summer run, it, it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, six months ago, there's nothing there. You mean on Miles Run? Yeah. 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 But now, I mean, when you look at it, you're like, how many more houses can they build? It's I know. Like, I know. They go, they go insane. fast. They go really fast. And like I said, some families bought these back in the summer, and they started construction, and now they're finishing and they're moving in. So. Um, section three, if you guys don't have any other questions there, let's move on to staffing on uh, section three. And um, obviously new students, you know, puts a demand on the district to have the appropriate staff in place. And um, I, I think on page 19 is probably the best place to go. Um, you know, we're probably looking at, and, and Travis and I haven't had the time to discuss in detail. I know this is probably way more than what's in the budget and you know, what is ultimately decided on in the spring uh, and during the early summer you know, is just gonna be dependent upon what enrollment looks like, but they're coming. I mean, you can see the houses being finished. People are coming. And um, we're looking at possibly with our classified staff, um, maintenance and custodial, I think we're sufficient. Food service, there's actu actually a chance we could benefit from that. Um, the preschool and learning center has a staff member over there as a cook, um, really to, to serve the students that are in the Prep for Success program, which are ESC classrooms. There are, th there are three classrooms over there. Those may be potentially moving down to the uh, General Sherman, the old General Sherman building that was purchased by the Lancaster Parks. The ESC may be leasing some classrooms out of there from the Lancaster Parks where they can put some additional preschool classrooms um, not necessarily Bloom Carroll. We can, we can house ours at the uh, Preschool and Learning Center. But the older kids uh, going up to grades eight that are in that building in those Prep for Success classrooms may move out. That means we wouldn't have to serve lunch because our preschool kids, that, which are managed by the uh, ESC Learning Steps Preschool, they're on half days now. So we're not serving lunch in the middle of the day. So we might be able to absorb that food service position a little bit, or or maybe you know move it move it somewhere. Um, tech, I think we're sufficient with tech as well. Um, aides and secretaries, secretarial staff, I think we're fine from an aid standpoint. That's really dependent upon student needs. For example, IEPs potentially. Um, transportation. Travis is going to get into this more later under his uh, some finance information and ridership, but. We're, we're high with our, our bus count for that Wagnalls Run development, and if we see those homes fill up with students, we're, we're probably looking at another bus route for next year. So, you know, potentially um, one bus route, um, potentially maybe an aid, and I'll get to that, but that's with the high school. Um, certified positions, the elementary school, you know, one additional position or possibly transfer from fourth grade into fifth grade, um, depending on, you know, that, that's a large fourth grade group. We're gonna need eight sections in fifth grade, but the third grade group going into fourth grade is a little bit smaller. Um, if we can make a transfer or a repurpose a position, we could do that. Um, at the middle school, we, we are probably looking at uh, two new teaching positions, and on page um, 17 in your packet, I asked Mr. Matchett and Ms. Johnson 
and Mr. Young to look at some scheduling options. And it's clear that with those numbers, we're at 26 per class right now. We're probably gonna have to go to eight sections of core academic areas in sixth and seventh grade. We're already there in eighth grade with the exception of social studies, which we'll probably need to make an eighth section as well. Uh, we'll have to modify some electives, uh, but we will have at the middle school, we will have an additional semester elective because the career connections teacher through the ESC will be full time, will be with us all year, both semesters. Currently, that, that individual is with Amanda Clear Creek half for one semester, then Blue Carroll the other half. The career center has found a way to give us an employee for the entire, for the entire year, which will help another elective called Career Connection. So we'll get more kids into that program. Um, we'll, we'll have to look at making adjustments to like computer science discoveries um, as an elective with art, maybe uh, creating uh, an additional section of art for, for eighth grade. Uh, we might, we're gonna move writing to a year long course potentially. Um, journalism, we might need to eliminate at the middle school with the, the uh, participation number of students that are selecting that it's really low probably down to about 10 to 10 to 12 students um, so it's not really serving a purpose right now uh, like we had thought it would and then um, we would uh, have to repurpose who's doing pre-engineering but the bottom line I guess at the end of the day at the middle school to make this happen and still offer a fair number of electives we're probably looking at two teachers probably an ELA math teacher for grades four to nine with a four to nine license and then probably an English language arts science teacher that we may have to add here as well. At the high school, um, we, we have some retirements. We have a math teacher retiring we're gonna need to replace. We have an English teacher we're gonna need to replace. Uh, those are not additional expenses. Honestly, they'll probably end up saving a little bit of money there. Um, we have a, a resignation from a foreign language teacher that we're gonna need to replace. Um, you know, with the honors diplomas and the, you know, kids need three foreign languages. And we've got a lot of kids already in years one or two. Um, we're, we're probably just going to have to continue uh, with another foreign language teacher uh, to offer Spanish and continue to offer Spanish and French at the high school. And then we have um, a media specialist right now that's a licensed teacher. And we're looking at potentially um, ways to help reduce the, the number of students in some of our science and social studies sections, we may need to look at um, replacing that teacher, but doing it with a science and social studies teacher, like a four to nine science and social studies teacher. But then how do we serve the media center? Uh, we might have to look at adding an aid there. So that would be a classified position, but um, you know, working with the high school administration and guidance on scheduling, those are some of the options. So again, at the end of the day, page 19, you know, there's um, five potential positions that we definitely see on the horizon. That could amount to $275,000 estimate of expense, uh, additional operating expense for the district. And Travis, I don't know if you, you know, <coughs> what you've looked at with that or what your thoughts yeah, are. Yeah, not, not that many. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I definitely look at additional teacher here in the middle school next year, um, perhaps a new bus route as we'll get into later. But um, mm -hmm. and hopefully we can shift to fourth grade to or yeah fourth grade mm -hmm. to fifth grade. But mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah. but we'll just again we'll have to watch enrollment. You know, um, what else? Um, other things I wanted to mention to you. Um, you know, I. I don't think this is a need next year. I, I think it's going to be a need. Um, but, you know, we, I think we got to look at, um, you know, we do have about, ten, about 1,040 to 50 students at our elementary school. We do have two principals. Um, we do have a social worker out there. Um, but, you know, somewhere in the future, potentially look, looking at like a dean um, or an assistant principal, maybe on a teacher contract. And one thing we could look at is maybe making that position like a, a um, an administrative contract on 185 day, like same, same number of days that when students are there and when teachers are there, that person is there. But the real planning takes place by the principals. And then there's times where they get so tied up during the day with some, some situations, minor behavior situations, that they're not always able to be out there interacting with the students the way they need to be and the staff in, in grade level meetings and things. And 
true instructional leadership, you gotta be with the teachers and you gotta be with the students. And I think we could potentially look at, like right now we contract with the ESC for our gifted services and that gifted coordinator services, Bloom Carroll and three other districts currently in Fairfield County. Potentially look at maybe a dean of students down the road um, on a 185 day contract and also be our gifted coordinator. So the, the you know, I'm, I'm estimating, but the 20 to 30,000 we're paying in gifted services to the ESC would be absorbed by that position. That it wouldn't, I don't know if being an assistant principal at the elementary school would totally consume from the beginning of the day till the end of the day, but they could also have some gifted responsibilities with K to 12 across our district. Does that make sense? So you save a little bit of money there. Yes, you, you still add an expense, but it's not as bad as it could potentially be if you look at maybe having that administrator do your gifted services. So, and, and, and I'm gonna bring this up, but as our district grows, um, I'll be honest guys, I, uh, I'm busy, I'm, I'm really busy. And it's unbelievable how much time I spend with, um, with the growth of the district. Um, working with entities, townships, you know, the county, um, a lot of different things. But I, I think, you know, in terms of having somebody that works with Travis and the superintendent, Travis and myself, that could really oversee um, a lot of the operations of the district. And, and what I mean by that is like supervising, overseeing, supervising, direct, you know, construction management, even these renovation projects take time in the district office modular and the procurement of services like Travis and I do this and and um, it doesn't allow us to do the other things that a superintendent needs to do um, to, to be quite honest and I just think as we continue to grow um, there are a lot of districts that currently have assistant superintendents and um, you know I think that we're going to have to look at some kind of assistant superintendent uh, operations, uh, chief operating officer or assistant superintendent of operations, something like that where they're uh, looking at construction management facilities, transportation, maintenance grounds, food service, emergency management plans. I mean, I spend a lot of time on uh, updating our plans and making sure we're in compliance with all that. Uh, custodial operations, te overseeing technology, working basically with the food service the, the maintenance, um, the transportation, all the classified staff, um, maybe helping with principal evaluations that have to be done in OPEZ. Um, I, I just think that, you know, it's, uh, I spend a lot of time in these, in that arena, and I ju just don't feel like I'm always able to devote the amount of time that I need to the other vision pieces of the district. But Fairfield Union, Assistant Soup, Logan L, smaller than us, assistant soup, Circleville, assistant soup, Logan Hawking, assistant soup, now Winchester is bigger, but they've had one when they were our size uh, in smaller. Uh, Pickerton, of course, has many assistants. Uh, Lancaster, of course, has uh, directors that work directly with the superintendent. Hamilton Township, Tays Valley, Groveport, Madison. Um, I, I don't know when the time's gonna be right, but especially you know, as we continue to look at our facility plans, um, it just consumes a lot of time. There's a lot of requirements for um, of getting services and you know, some of the things we have going on here potentially this year, whether it's abatement of the high school, uh, the ceiling tiles, whether it's a press box project, whether it's renovations to the district office. I mean, I'm walking through with engineers, I'm walking through with, um, you know, architects, and I mean, this stuff, the, the planning of this takes a lot of time. And um, I just think somewhere down the road, we're gonna have to take a good look at that as we are at 2,200 students and eventually 24, 2,600. Um, but we've added a lot of certified, a lot of teaching positions over the years. We haven't added a lot of administrative positions. And um, I just think down the road somewhere, when the time is right, we, we're gonna have to take a look at that, okay? Um, Next, um, let's move on to uh, facilities and safety, section four. Um, so there was a uh, bill that was passed that allows uh, school district, the Senate Bill 319, I think it passed back in April, 
and it permits Narcan to be available for the administration in emergency situations at certain service entities, and this a service entity includes schools. Yeah, yeah, all right. And um, you know, it's one of those things where you hate to think that you know you don't do it necessarily because you think you have students or you're aware of students that are involved in uh, those types of drugs. However, it does happen where students overdose. But more importantly, here recently, the CDC, um, other health uh, entities have been trying to make parents aware that a lot of these uh, drug manufacturers, drug dealers, cartels are making drugs to look like, I mean, it looks like candy to a, to a young child. And uh, it's, it's laced with fentanyl. And these children can easily overdose. Uh, if we ever had a student you know, get exposed to that type of thing by accident, uh, having Narcan on hand in our school buildings uh, might be something we really want to consider. I've been working with the Fairfield County EMA Director, John Coaches, and Scott Duff um, from Project 4. To me, this is something that like an assistant superintendent could do in, in the future. But uh, Project 4 stands for the Fairfield County Overdose Response Team. And um, they, they provide free Narcan, but there are requirements. We don't have to have policy on Narcan but you do have to have um, written, you do have to have a uh, written protocols um, in place that have to be established by either a physician or the board of health. And um, you know, you're seeing some things on the news here recently with Halloween and stuff. But even you take that out of it, I just think we're in an era that it, it you know, we 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 started using EpiPens. We we procured EpiPens about three years ago. Well, we've had to use this three times for kids that were allergic to things that we didn't know about. In fact, we had to use EpiPens today on a student that made a huge difference. The nurse came over, you know, and the student was actually able to stay in the school but was having a, an adverse allergic reaction. Um, so I'm glad we did that. But I hate to, Narcan, people think, oh, you have heroin in your schools. And I, I'm not aware of that. But, you know, if, if a young child or a high schooler did OD, whether it's on accident, or through a drug use, having that Narcan could save a life. Mm -hmm. And um, there, there are, you know, there's OSBA guidance on it. I've provided that for you on page 20 and um, page 21. But again, this is something that we could get. I would work with a physician or a board of health. Um, I'm working with, again, Scott Duff from Project Fort. And um, I just think that, you know, this is something we, we probably, I, I probably need to pursue and um, again, it would only be used in emergency situations and very descriptive uh, uh, guidelines for administering this and who is trained. There's training that's required. Um, but uh, again, I, I didn't know if I could get any feedback and thoughts on this, you know, what you guys think. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. Right. I think it's hard for people to say, my gosh, you have to have an arcane in your school. <coughs> well, I think it's more of a societal issue, you know. So um, I'll probably continue to pursue this, and uh, we'll probably end up getting our nurses trained, and um, we'll get some protocols in place, and I'll, I'll have the board approve the emergency use, you know, if, if we ever had to. Okay. So, all right. The next item, um, I wanted to make you aware, obviously, this has been a rough month, and um, you know, one thing we want to do is make sure that we are doing everything we can to keep our students safe. And uh, I'm not going to talk about a specific situation or uh, individuals, but, you know, it, it clearly, you know, doing everything we can to prevent abuse and identify, even identify where abuse could potentially occur, I think is, you know, an important part of keeping our students as safe as possible. And there are organizations out there. One that I recently met with is called Presidium. Now, Presidium, I want to make be clear, they're currently in no K to 12 public school districts in the in the U.S. Not exactly sure why. You know, I could maybe make some assumptions, but uh, they are in independent or private schools uh, across the country, and they work with uh, higher education, such as Ohio State University, who had a situation. Think about Michigan State, uh, Penn State had a situation. And uh, Presidium is basically a third party organization. They've been around for about uh, 30 years now. But they come in and they work with, you know, healthcare, social services, youth development programs, religious institutions, the hospitality industry. And their goal is, 
is to prevent abuse and identify where abuse could occur. And it's a third party that can come in. And I think in the future, as we work through the current issues that we're dealing with this month, uh, I think it's important whether it's this organization or another to objectively come in and really take a good look at reviewing uh, several organizational operations to make sure that we do have procedures that are, are the most effective um, in, in preventing and providing, you know, preventing abuse and providing a safe place. And Presidium, it's an accreditation process, but they review policies, uh, the screening and how we screen and select employees, how we train our employees about these types of things, how we monitor and supervise our students, um, whether it's after school with coaching or during the school day. Um, they, they seek internal feedback systems or they review operations with internal feedback systems and consumer participation from parents and students and staff. Um, they look at how you respond to issues and they look at your administrative practices um, that you know, you're, you're attempting to put into place to create you know, a safe environment. And there are several steps to this accreditation process and this particular one takes well over a year or just about a year in terms of implementation and then site visits and reviewing documentation and policies and then offering corrective action uh, you know, recommendations. And that accreditation process lasts for three years and you have to do this every three years. Um, it's about, it's about twenty-five dollars to $30,000 to go through the accreditation process with this particular organization, but there are other resources too that... Are there uh, other ones that are school-based? Yeah, yeah, and, th and this is, don't get me wrong, this, they, they work with schools, uh, private schools, um, you know, they're not in public schools right now, they do work with some private schools, uh, they work with higher ed, uh, they are currently in contract with Ohio State and working with them on the Strauss case. Um, but I just wanted to make you aware that I think this is important that at some point here um, in the near future when we can we move forward and we really take a good make a you know a good review of our district and from an outside perspective and make sure that uh, we're doing everything we can and have the every all the pieces in place to be as safe as we can. I don't think thirty thousand sounds that bad to be honest with you. Yeah. When you were saying about Ohio State. Yeah. I was wondering, but you know, how much is one of the Yeah. I mean, right. It's not only ten. Right. So. Yeah, and uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if that that's probably not real out of line in the industry, but um, I just wanted to make you aware that this is something I'm looking at, and I think there will be a need. There's a need for it. I'd be just curious to see one that does work with schools. I would think that their yeah. goals would be different than private sector, even though there are some private schools, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but universities. I mean, I, I feel like maybe their yeah. intentions would be different at a K-12 level because you're looking at younger yeah. people, you know, parents, right. community members. Um, yeah. Interesting to see another company. Yeah, no. But I think that we definitely need to make a move on some, some type of review. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the next thing in terms of the safety and facilities, um, I wanted to share with you um, a, a uh, it's a visitor management uh, it's a visitor management system. Um, you know, traditionally, you know, when you visit a school, you come in, you sign, you sign the form, you put the date and time, and that's about it, and that's all we know. You know, when you step into our building. And um, there's, there's, a, uh, th there's a program, it's called Raptor Visitor Technology, and it basically screens for BCI, FBI, sex offenders, custody issues, banned visitors from your district. Um, and it, it is definitely, uh, I think, an affordable uh, program that we can implement at the front desk in all of our school buildings. Um, currently, we got a quote for about $5,800 at a one-time fee. And then there's an $1,800 annual recurring fee uh, for the district after that initial purchase. I could see Travis and I maybe include this on the wish list in the spring uh, to potentially consider. But um, I wanted to share this video with you real quick from Raptor's uh, Raptor visitor, man visitor Management System. So $1,500. When it comes to protecting your students and staff, knowing exactly who is in your building. When it comes to protecting your students and staff, Knowing exactly who is in your building at all times is an absolute necessity. And unfortunately, traditional paper and pencil signage sheets offer a false sense of protection and aren't the real solution for keeping our schools safe. Raptor Technologies Visitor Management is a state-of-the-art system that instantly screens for sex offenders, custody issues, and banned visitors. And you always know who is in the building, why they're there, where they're going, and who they are there to visit. 
With Raptor, you can access an emergency panic button and silent alarm on every screen and maintain accurate records of all visitors, volunteers, and contractors that can be accessed school or district-wide. Protecting your students from over 750,000 registered sex offenders in the U.S. In fact, every single school day, Raptor issues an average of 75 sex offender alerts and 150 custom alerts, most often custody issues, in our clients' schools. That's a level of protection your district can't afford to be without. Find out why Raptor is trusted to protect more schools than all other visitor management systems combined. Visit us online at raptortech.com to learn more or schedule a free demo. So is that just during the day? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. So it would be in the offices. Basically, you'd walk in, and you'd have to have your ID, and it would it would uh, scan your ID <coughs> against all kinds of. It's like an, an immediate background check. Um, it would be, you know, sex offender list. Or anybody that's been charged, if it's... That's true. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You know, if it's something new, yeah, a custody battle or something, it's really hard. It would only catch it if it was on the list, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. So, but again, I think it's, it's an added security now, you know. How do people feel every time they come in and get your ID out? You know, and, and we couldn't treat one person different than another, even uh, if we know you. A parent who's there three or four times that week and yeah. we're doing that every time. But yeah. yeah. I go on school all the time and I forget and I'm like, I have to go back and get my I have to go back and get it. Yeah. They're like, We know you. You've been here every year. And, I know. and the reason we do that is because sometimes we see people in the office that, you know, may not know somebody as well and they're like, Well, well you've got a new secretary here, she probably doesn't know anybody. Yeah. And why didn't you scan that parent but you scan right. me? And and things can happen. Maybe you saw a parent in, in September and the next time you see him is in January. It's something that's happened in between and now will it be flagged? You know, right. um, I mean, most people understand there might be, you know, there always is a handful of people who get upset. And, yeah, and right. Know. I'll be honest, there are school districts around here using this system currently. Yeah, yeah. It's smaller check, than us. Check, check the cost on it, though. It's 5800 Well, that's what they said, but they charge you per trans, per scan. No, each time. no. We got, I mean, we have a quote from them, okay. and uh, it's 5800 and then. Yearly. 5800 for one time for the everything, okay. and then uh, after that, it's, it's 1800 It's 1800 for a year after that for the district. Oh, they look great out here. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, Travis? Um, I, I, I haven't <laughs> delved into it a lot, but I, I think it's it would be worth it. And it sounds reasonable. As long as we applied it uniformly and everybody understands yeah, that know, it's... you got to make that. There's going to be a major learning curve. Yep. Yeah. As frustrated as people get, we're doing it to ensure the safest environment possible. I okay. think that's... Would it be worth having the teachers scan every day? Have the teachers scan? Well, so if there is ever a staff member that is um, charged with something arrested, they're already enrolled in an ODE system called the Ratback system. And if there's ever an arrest or anything or a charge, we get notified through the Ohio Department of Education. It's called the Ratback Enrollment. So that's already, those are already in place. Um, but anyway, I thought, I, you know, I, I definitely see some benefits to that. It's, you know, there, there's tough decisions. That all these things cost money, and, and it adds up. And we're talking about staffing positions. We're talking about some facility needs that we have. You know, we're talking about safety. Um, so there are some tough decisions. The next thing in regarding safety. So school resource officer. We added that about three years ago, and I, three or four years ago. And I think it's one of the best things that we, we have added. I'll be honest, I have concerns that, you know, there's still, you still have to, we have one resource officer that has to travel between the elementary and the middle school and high school, right. and they can't be in two places at one time, and it takes four or five minutes to get out there, even when you're in a hurry. So that's always been on my mind, and, um, you, you know, you always look and say, what, what more can we do, right? What more can we do to make our schools as safe as place possible? And one thing that we've clearly learned with uh, over the last 22, 23 years is that neutralizing a threat quickly is the key. And not an hour later, you know, not responding 20 minutes later. The damage is done, and, and these are tough things to talk about. The damage is done in the first two to three minutes of a, of a school shooting. And um, our SROs do more than deal with school shootings. They really help us. But up in Summit County, I started a program with retired uh, uh, deputy sheriffs. and. Um, they are basically being employed directly by school districts. And 
this has kind of uh, gotten some legs here in Fairfield County, but we have a full-time school resource officer that we pay, you know, his, his normal salary through the sheriff's department. We pay his, his retirement. We pay his, his uh, health insurance and everything. That cost is paid, passed on to us for nine months a year, and then the sheriff's office pays the other three months, basically. This, that's a very expensive position it's, that we have to pay for. It's close to about $90,000, I yeah. think. Uh, for our school resource officer, but it's a it's a worthwhile investment. I don't, I don't lose any sleep at night knowing that we're doing it. Right. My question is, how do we do more? You know, um, the, the sheriff's office. Um, we've kind of worked with them a little bit. I've been talking to them for a couple months, but they're every now and then they're getting a retired deputy that's looking to do something in retirement, and they don't want to be out on patrol in you know around the county, but they wouldn't mind being in a in a school. You right. know, especially the school districts in Fairfield County. And uh, there's a potential to look at the district actually hires a retired but still commissioned auxiliary sheriff's deputy. They're still in uniform. They, they do all the training. They provide all the training at the sheriff's office, but it's technically our employee. Now, the school resource officer that we have is not. That is contracted. But we have to still have the same abilities. If there was an yes, like however, if there was a, a, a police report that needed to be taken because this person is paid at a much lower rate, um, the, the, the main SRO takes the lead in these school gotcha. districts. But these are retired individuals that still want to work, but you know they don't want to be working second or third shift out on patrol. They don't want to be doing all the paperwork. But the biggest thing is having somebody in a school building that can respond within seconds. Mm -hmm. And um, there, there is a cost to it. I mean, we would you have to look at potentially an hourly rate and uh, some of the another school that's doing this is about 2250 an hour for these retired individuals but I you know if I look at it and say look you know six or seven hours a day you only get paid on the days that you're here if there's a day that you have to take off you know you just don't get paid but we don't provide vacation time we don't provide personal days when our students are here you're here as a retired auxiliary commissioned officer and you're providing safety at our elementary school or over You wouldn't here. just use someone like that for both? No. SRO, you have to keep the SRO? Yeah, I, I, want, okay. I want somebody that is you know, currently active and not retired, you know, not several years right. out. But um, I do think it would be worthwhile. So would you leave the retired one at the elementary? Um, I, I, would, I would have them interchange a little bit. I still want them to know the st all the staff members. But you know, ideally, you know, middle school, high school is where you have some more violent issues with students and uh, you know I think having a, a sheriff's deputy there uh, is, is important but also what I'm saying is I think it's important to have one at the elementary school as well um, if you paid an hourly rate at seven hours a day for 176 student days you're looking at twenty seven thousand dollars in expense and then Travis and I believe because it is a uh, school em employee we would have to pay into the uh, school employees retirement system and um, you know, potentially, you know, there's there's extra contributions there of 14% that the school district has to pay in. So 14% is about $3,800. You know, we may be looking at total cost to provide extra security for $31,000 compared to a full-time SRO at, at 90. At 90. And right. um, I, I think we could get somebody in place this year after January that's retiring. And um, I'm really interested in it. And, and I'll be honest. If, if we're in deficit spending over $20,000, but I know those kids are safe out there, it's worth it to me, you know? So I don't, I'm not saying we're gonna be in deficit spending. Travis knows more about that than I do. <laughs> Travis is like, okay, it's cha-ching, it's <laughs> ching but, cha <laughs> but, you know, if we're splitting hairs like that, <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's other areas that we're going to have to have some to money. go. It's got to be a major concern. You know, but I'd really like to pursue this. There's typically an MOU done with the sheriff's office, and um, if we find the right individual um, at a really cost-effective rate, I think it would be great to have all, all of our buildings covered. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think it's a no yeah, yeah. It's important. Okay. okay. Um, OSCC updates. Uh, let me just jump into this. I'm not going to read through all this. It starts on page uh, 40. I just read her letter. Is that exciting or is it scary? Uh, it's, it, it's, it's, it's neither. A little bit of a downer. Okay. Yeah, the downer. But yeah. don't get too excited or do, do, do no, get don't, too don't get yet. too excited. So, okay. you know, every year I ask for an OSCC update on where we rank on their eligibility list for funding. And you know we built two school, two projects here in the last 10 years with ELP funds, meaning it's a credit that we'll someday get. Well, bottom line is, the good news is we moved from 35th on the list last year up to 25th 
on the list. So That's it's coming, job. right? That's it's coming. Job. But um, the problem is the state, you know, appropriates their, their expenditures, their funds for OFCC projects every two years in the uh, state budget. And the, right now they're only able to fund about five to 10 districts per year. And that's mainly due to construction costs that have gone up. So money's there and we moved up on the list, but the money doesn't go as far due to construction costs. So there's also lapsed districts, districts that were not able to pass bond issues. So they didn't get money, but if they do pass it, now the state throws them back into the mix and they can jump in line again if they eventually pass it. Um, so they, they can impact you know, how soon we uh, receive the CFAP money. Um, I'll continue to receive updates annually, but the bottom line, last year we were 35th and they told us we're four to five years out. This year we're 25th, but we're still about four to five years out. We're good with four to five though, right? I well, mean, and, and I, think that, I think that justifies, you know, okay, look at our enrollment. You, right. know, you look at maybe using some of the remaining uh, construction funds to make some renovations to move the district office, free up that space for the high school. And then we're looking at maybe five, six years, right? And, and maybe then when we get our credit and we're in CFAP, now you can pass a bond issue easier and it's more cost for way less money for way less money, you know? So I thought that was, that's the plan. That is, that okay. is, but I just wanted to let you know, we moved up on the list, but we're still the same year now. I mean, that's really good on our timeline. Yeah, that but, works yeah. well. So even if next year we're three to four years, yeah. still I, four to five. I mean, yeah. you were thinking seven to 10, yeah. right? Initially, yeah. so yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's a good thing we're still four to five, because we're not ready. I would agree with that. So yeah. I don't think, I don't think it's, necessary right now no. based upon our elementary middle school and we have an option at the high school that we've talked about so I just I think we're I think we're okay um, we need to get a little creative with the high school but we're kind of doing that um, so potential projects coming up um, potential projects coming up this isn't really in your packet but um, the district office, the old primary school. Uh, right now we're working with RDFA. They were the mechanical, electrical, plumbing engineers on the elementary school project that worked with Shore Architects. So Shore and RFDA, RDFA are reviewing the, the uh, project potential costs. They've walked through the building many times. They've looked at some old plans that we have. They're creating new plans. Um, they're getting ready to propose like a scope of work and uh, potential cost to manage that because there would be several subcontractors. But what we're looking at there right now is some interior paint, excluding the gym, excluding the bathrooms in the back of the building, but we're looking at interior paint, um, we're looking at interior carpet or, the whole thing. Uh, or tile. For about, um, for about... Because I mean, 10 years, is the building would be gone, right? Yeah, but... I mean, yeah, I mean, but... So this is minimal Yeah, yeah this, stuff. this is minimal stuff, and we're talking very affordable. Okay. Like, we're not talking LVT, like we put in the elementary okay. school. You're talking your VCT, your typical tile and, and stuff like that. Okay. With a very, very cheap carpet squares, um, something very, you know, just to cut down on the noise, uh, make it more office-like. But you're looking at interior paint, potentially interior carpet, um, some rubber baseboard uh, in some areas. Uh, the rooms don't really need that, but the hallways probably do. Um, there's a um, some Cat6 cable, some tech cable, some Cat6 uh, wiring that needs to be ran for computers, uh, for desktop computers. Um, you're looking at maybe some furniture, some flexible furniture that for what would be the board meeting room in the old library. And um, that'll also serve as a conference room for administrative meetings. Um, those are some of the things we're, we're kind of looking at. Uh, bathroom, ADA compliance with some toilets and stalls. Um, but we're trying to keep the cost down. Um, I, don't, I don't think with construction costs we're going to be able to do it within uh, what is remaining in the construction fund. I think there may have to be some permanent improvement funds or general fund money expended to do that. And uh, we'll eventually be able to bring that to you. But there's potential that this January, February, we could start doing some, some minor work in there. And uh, no, no real time frame to like get moved in the summertime. Eventually when we can move and it's done, we can move. And then the phase two of that is turning the district office offices back, in the back into classrooms and they're looking at that too, and they're gonna break out that cost separately. So, um, any questions about that? I just wanna let you know that we are working on that. Um, other potential projects, um, the high school abatement, this, uh, the Ohio Department of Development is honestly killing me. It's taking forever to uh, award 
the Brownfield Remediation Grant Funds. I was really hoping we'd know by now so we could start planning and see how much that project would cost, how much you know, grant funds that we receive, and then you gotta start the planning process because you gotta close off a lot of the building to do the abatement, which takes place with, which would take place in June and early July. So uh, I don't know, I mean, Travis and I keep saying next year, next year, next year. And um, again, that would remove the uh, first floor ceiling tiles and put new lights in and, and get rid of the old cruddy. In high school? In high school, the old rusted grids and those ceiling tiles that are hot, that are the whole asbestos. Or just first floor? First floor, yeah, kind of down to the T, down by the media center. And this will be paid for out of that? If you get that money. grant. But we don't know yet. We don't, I don't have an answer yet. And I'm, the fact is we're running short on time. We're, we're just, in terms of planning that and getting on the schedule, we're running short. The other option is ESSER funds. Yeah, I'm going to talk about those, that. But when do those have to be expended by? They ha it's, it's on my section here, but um, the ESSER 3 has to be expended by September of 24. I'll be honest with you. If it gets back to putting the abatement in the ESSER 3, um, we're not going to have enough time to do it this summer. It just, it just doesn't we have fit the timeline. Funds that could go we to the we could push them back to the summer of 24. Push the abatement back to next summer? The summer of 24, but uh, there's still a little some hoops to jump I, through I there. Guess so. my point is I, I, you know, I'd rather wait for the grant. If we get the grant, okay, now we'll try to get it together. But if that falls, I, I hate to go ahead and spend the extra funds on that right now, and then we get the grant coming through right. in January. You know, what but I mean? if we get the grant, can we also wait for two summers if we get the grant late? No, no, no. That has to. We'll have to try to slam it together for June and July. It'll be a challenge. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that. You know, the, the cost on that was, you know, in February 2016, we got a quote. It was about two hundred ninety to three hundred five thousand dollars to do that back in 2016. So you can you can bet us four hundred right now. Yeah, yeah. Easy. <laughs> yeah. Um, district office modular transition. Uh, just talked about uh, press box. Just so you know, I was told by the boosters that they have uh, the boosters, athletic boosters, did approve a donation uh, contingent upon the board accepting the donation to move on this project. But a $225,000 donation for a press box, that would cover the press box and a camera deck on top. Um, the, the project would, would be uh, bid through uh, TIPS Purchasing Cooperative, and um, that's who they've been working with. And the district would have quite a bit of cost, um, you know, somewhere between $100,000 to probably $125,000. I still don't have a cost on demolition, so Dennis is uh, trying to help find a demolition company. Uh, but the current press box, this would be done in late May, uh, June, and early July, so that it's ready for fall sports in uh, the fall of 23. Uh, but you have demo costs, not sure what that looks like right now, but soil borings, potentially, you may not need them. The depths of the footers are only three feet, six inches, so you may not need soil borings, but it may be safe to spend a couple thousand to make sure you know, because we did get into some bad soils on the light poles out there. Um, Foundations, we got a quote. Um, in October of 21, the foundations were 30,000. That same work is now $47,580 for the foundations of the is press box. Is it It's their pillars, their oh. pads and then pillars, and then the steel comes down onto them. So it's just not one, it's just not one big pad. They're like cylinders. So, mm. um, the understructure, the, the steel understructures, 30,000, uh, the freight, uh, to get it here is 5,000. The installation is about 12,500. The electrical hookup is about 8,123 on a quote we received. So that did not include the sound hookup and the demo. So I'm thinking probably around 125,000 that we would have to allocate for that kind of project. Is that permanent fund? It could. Be. I'd have to look. It, partially, not all of it could be, but partially. What, so, what was their timeline in terms of the donation? Oh, and, or, I'm sorry. No, yeah. that's what I just... Yeah, so the boosters, uh, they're planning to um, make a donation November 14th. Uh, Travis would have to set up a fund, have the board approve it, and then at that point, Travis would start the contract with the purchasing co-op, and we would have to get this scheduled. So and they want to do it in May, no. May, June, and July. I think the push is because I'm well known. If they took all this money, they want to get it done. I get it. No, I agree. It just, that's a lot of work. It is. It's six months. I mean, yeah. to get it all planned. Right. Right. Are they going to oversee it? Like, who's going to be the no, project we, manager? All of us. Yeah. All of us. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. We got so many things going on that 
take a ton of our time. If there was somebody to work with Travis and, and Den Dennis and you know, Dennis and, and Dennis and, and, and you know be that liaison between all of our, our, our maintenance and grounds people and food service, technology, transportation. I mean, we're constantly buying technology, and if we had somebody to oversee those areas, it, it would be a productive. I'm just saying. I'm just saying in the future. Twenty years ago, we looked at high school. Yeah, you know, we did a lot of the elementary school. Yeah. That's exactly what they had. And that was twenty years. Did you ever work with the superintendent directly on that? Yeah. Every no. once in a while, she would show up. And yeah. Just check it yeah. out. That was it. But that's that's what we. The only time I ever did. worked with the superintendent directly on a school job yeah. was ours with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was and that's what they said too. And we yeah. saved some money by by doing that. But right. you, you just realize there's a lot of things you're not able to get to. You know, but. Anyway, let's jump to section five on finance. Travis has some things um, that he can speak specifically to on ESSER and transportation. Yeah, real quickly, uh, more just informational, uh, but to kind of set the groundwork for some future uh, decisions that we're going to have to make. Uh, the bus counts, uh, this is very timely because we used to have to do a student count uh, the first week of October. We no longer have to do that. We are still required to do a ridership count the first week of October. So I th always think it's advantageous and to compare routed AM and PM routes, which you've been given uh, when Carmen was here and when we talked about this in the summer, compared to how many actual riders do we have, AM and PM, what you see here in the third and fourth column is an average of the five days, uh, which is a pretty good representation, first week of October. Yeah, there are some after school activities going on, but um, I think this is really, from my experience, has been uh, a pretty good indicator as to what our actual ridership is throughout the year. Um, so you see we have 17 routes. This just um, is our, our regular educational routes. This does include, uh, you know, career center, preschool, routes to the other MD units uh, or, or private schools. Uh, 17 routes uh, per day. You can see 1,424 average per day in the AM, 1,456 uh, at the bottom there, average in the PM as compared to what is routed, uh, a little over 80%. That's a little higher than normal, to be honest with you, but still, you could see pretty much on every route, um, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 less uh, riders than what's actually routed. Average high school, middle school route there at the bottom, you can see 35.7, 36.08. Average elementary, which would be perfect if all of our routes were, were this, but of course it's, it's an average. I've highlighted uh, five routes that are a little bit of concern. Uh, bus 9, 18, I think it's showing up in yellow, yeah. 9, 18, 20, 22, and 27. Uh, these are on between 72 and 77 passenger buses, so we're okay right now. Um, I did mark, I didn't mark it very clearly, so I apologize, a WR by the Wagnalls Run routes, which are bus 20 and 22. So to nobody's surprise, those are... Those are up there getting there. Um, you know, bus 22, if all of the kids rode, you can see we're down 9.4 and 13.2. We might be uh, in a little bit of an issue there. Um, but those are the things we're going to continue to monitor uh, to determine if we were going to add a route. It would be nice if we did add a route because we really don't need another high school, middle school route, quite frankly. It's tough to find someone to come in and only work three, three and a half hours a day and drive an elementary route. So... We just kind of have to look at our options, but um, you can see that's kind of top heavy in terms of looking at those routes that that you, you know we would might need to add uh, throughout the day. So again, if you know people say well your buses are packed or no, we're we're fine. Uh, again, there are a few uh, trouble spots, worry spots. I'll call them more more than trouble, but uh, keep, rest assured we're monitoring this. Mind, these buses, these seventy seven passenger, I think they have twenty six or twenty seven seats. So you're talking two kids per seat, right. you know. But which high school, middle school is all? It's what you're going to get, but yeah. you know, elementary is, is a little bit different. But yeah. uh, the last one is again just hearing some um, concerns about you know where are we spending our ESSER funds. Uh, again, there is a link uh, yeah, on my sec on the section. Back. Just a couple. Of the, yeah, um, and I understand. It's, uh, on a, a, it's on his website. It's there's quite a bit of money. There is a link uh, on my page on the website. It's a little more uh, abstract, a little wordy, because it's in the exact format that ODE wanted and we were required. Um, I hope in this format, which I will post as well, is uh, maybe it paints a little clearer of a picture. Uh, there are four sections of ESSER. 
uh, the first one being uh, American Rescue Plan IDEA, uh, which is specific to only special education um, expenditures. And again, all of these funds are given to us with the caveat of it has to relate to loss of learning brought upon by the pandemic COVID-19 and or recovering from COVID-19. Again, the initial things were a lot of cleaning things, a lot of sanitation, a lot of things like that that we're just, we don't have the need for anymore, that we've got plenty of that. And then how do you, if you would have to shut down again, uh, what provisions do you have in place? What kind of expenditures have you made to, to prepare yourself? Uh, God forbid if, if something like that were to happen again. So has that with the backdrop. And then coming from the federal government, they are heavily, heavily scrutinized monthly. He get, Sean gets the emails as well. We're filling out uh, detailed reports, uh, uploading documents to show how we're spending these funds, along with part of the Auditor of States, uh, their audit program. So again, they're heavily scrutinized, and there's a pretty tight expenditure window that we're operating under with these funds. So again, we're not we're not complaining. Uh, we're happy to have the funds, but I know they're ext extremely streamlined. Um, I'm I'm happy with the ARP that we were ad able to add additional services, as opposed to supplementing existing special education services. So we've uh, funded two of those items that were on the wish list, the additional psychologist services from the ESC, and then we added an intervention specialist at the elementary school. That's the good news. The bad news is uh, this ends on 9-1-23, so past that, we're going to assume that in our general fund. But again, I think, as we talked about the wish list, these were two very worthwhile uh, expenditures that were at least able to fund for one year under the, the American Rescue Plan. Uh, SR1 is now complete. You can see how we spent the uh, 87 through 86. Um, let me jump down to SR2 uh, because that is almost completely spent, even though we have about another year. You can see, if you recall, we did set up uh, $1,000 in May of 22 uh, that we paid to all the teachers and classified staff, uh, not the administration. We worded it to fit within uh, the ESSER guidelines. Uh, summer school we paid for this year our student assessments that Sean talked about the map uh, to address you know where our students are where where did the, did the learning loss occur and then of, of course our technology our one to one uh, that allows for some of that distance learning ESSER three uh, is runs from uh, 21 we were already in the grant period till 24 next year's uh, May of 23rd uh, 23 teacher and classified st stipends will come from here Next year's summer school will come from here. Uh, our letters, dyslexia, I think it should say, it should say training, not screening. Uh, we funded this summer, uh, which obviously helped us uh, in that area. We talked about the additional dyslexia screening that we're going to have to purchase, at least to get us um, off the ground with that program. We are going to take that out of ESSER 3. And again, student assessments next summer. Uh, but again, this technology and abatement, I've got question mark is 424 761 again i don't think we're in any position timeline wise or information wise to move forward with the abatement out of sr3 in the summer of 23 with the high school outside of the grant if we were going to do that it would have to be uh, in the spring and summer of 24 so depending on where we go if we're awarded the grant i'll probably be coming back to the board in february and saying all right here's the amount of sr3 we have where do you think? You know, I'll have some suggestions. Administration will have some suggestions, but where do you guys want to go with, um, you know, the, these re the remainder of these funds? So again, I summarized it at the bottom: um, special education, extended learning, uh, dyslexia. I won't read through all that, but uh, non-public we were required with ESSER one uh, to support the non-publics: uh, St. Mary's, uh, Fisher Catholic, and uh, Fairfield Christian, where we have students. Uh, we were required to allocate them a per, per pupil amount. Um, and then you see the technology and uh, either future technology or abatement or, or something else because we're kind of running out of uh, areas that we can spend these funds on. But again, just a more of a summarized dollar amount summarization to, to post and, and provide transparency to the public. That's a lot of good information. Yeah. <laughs> just uh, our world is what we're, we're doing right now. So along with other things, but um, yeah, I don't know if any, any questions. We'll try our best to answer any questions. And no, I just think, I mean, obviously, you know, the wish list when the best one I'll have our next planning session, I think obviously from here, between there and now, I think safety is the top priority, at least for me, I'm sure probably the rest of you as well. Um, and the, the 27,000, if we can get that through, yeah. you know, the retirement. Yeah, process. I love that idea. I mean, that's, that's a great, I feel very strong about that. Good. Yeah. I'll get moving on it tomorrow. Okay.
Thank you. Good. Number letter F, adjourn the recess. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Motion made by Rod Johnson, second by Jim Sherman. Mr. Rod Johnson? Yes. Mrs. Sherman? Yes. Mr. Abbott? Yes. Mr. Jimmy Johnson? Yes. I'm 716.